Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I've been here at Sophia for 40 years. This is my 40, 40th year of teaching. I began teaching, I began teaching in 1974. So this is my 40th year. Uh, and actually, officially my final year. <laughs> I should be retiring at the end of uh, March. But I have been asked to stay, so I will be staying. At least for a couple more years, I guess. Until uh, we get the TEEP test and everything that I'll be uh, talking about later on uh, going and, and starting a new curriculum that we will be starting next uh, uh, April. We've got to get that on the roll as, as well. So uh, until things start rolling, I probably will be here for another several years. Okay. All right, so let me today talk about some uh, issues. Let's begin by talking about some issues which have uh, been proposed by the Liberal Democratic Party, the government, and also by MEXT. Uh, as uh, things that they want to do to improve English education in, in Japan. Uh, one of those things, uh, and a lot of people are concerned about this, is the, the, uh, the lowering of the grade in which English will be introduced in the elementary school from fifth grade to third grade. Uh, and also uh, making uh, English uh, from fifth grade on an official subject in itself, which means that it will be tested. Uh, there will be assessment, uh, there will be a need for uh, professional teachers of English. Up until the present time, since uh, uh, English in the elementary school is what people might call an, a, uh, an experiential subject. It's, uh, it's not really an official subject per se. It's, uh, it can be taught by the homeroom teacher. It can be taught by outside uh, people uh, without any license to teach English. Uh, they can be volunteers and so forth, but once it becomes an official subject, then uh, officially it needs a professional to teach it. And that's going to cause a lot of problems because we haven't got too many of those at the present time, especially for elementary school. One thing which is possible that people are thinking of, uh, the, mini the ministry is thinking of, is that if you have a, a, um, uh, a license to teach uh, in the uh, junior high school, then you can officially teach in elementary school. So that's one thing which is possible. So here at Sophia, since we do not uh, offer a uh, license uh, for teaching in the elementary school, uh, what we will be doing starting next April is <clears throat> we will be including a course on teaching English in the elementary schools uh, as an optional subject in the, uh, the Kyosho Kate. Uh, in the courses which are offered to, to get a license for a junior high school. That way, uh, I hope that we will be able to prepare uh, teachers with uh, junior high school licenses to be able to go down to the elementary schools to help out because there are over 22,000 elementary schools in the country. Uh, and that means a lot of teachers are going to be necessary, and we really don't have that many. There are a lot of issues here, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this for now. Uh, another point which is being mentioned uh, is that, uh, as you, many of you probably already know, uh, starting this past April, uh, in the senior high schools, uh, English is basically supposed to be taught through the medium of English. Um, now, what percentage of the courses are being taught in English at the present time, we don't know for sure yet, but we want to try to figure out uh, get some data on that. Now, there are um, at least fragmentary data which have been coming out from different prefectures. Uh, I have some data from um, Tokyo itself. I'm on a committee in Tokyo for the Tokyo government to revise English education for, for Tokyo itself. And uh, I did receive some data on that. But, uh, but from what I see, uh, it doesn't look very promising. <laughs> Um, it, although there are some uh, smaller prefectures where almost 100% of all the courses, all the teachers are now teaching in English. There are such prefectures. Uh, there are three basic, very educationally minded prefectures, Fukui, uh, and Yamanashi, and also Akita. These are very strong educational prefectures. And as far as I know, in most of the schools, high schools in these three prefectures, English is being taught through the medium of English. And 
But in other prefectures, I'm not really sure. Especially the large places like Tokyo and Osaka and these Nagoya and these big places, the, the, the percentage is still very, very low. Still very, very low. Okay. Uh, now what the ministry is saying is, well, if we're going to have um, senior high school teachers uh, basically teach English through the medium of, Im of uh, English, then uh, at, least, uh, at least in several years' time, we would, we would need to have the junior high school teachers teach in English as well. At the present time, uh, the percentage of uh, senior high school teachers who have a pre-first grade in the step test, new EQ, uh, is a little over 50%. It's going up. It's going up. It used to be a little less than 50%, but now it's a little over than 50%, 52, 53%, which is not bad. But the percentage of junior high school teachers with the same doing EQ level is still about 27%. Uh, it used to be about 25. Now it's up to 27, which is going up. But still, it's still 27%. Which means that it's going to take a little more time for junior high school teachers to feel confident in themselves in the use of English in the classroom. But at least that's something that the, the government is trying to implement. Um, another thing which has come out uh, in the, uh, the reports uh, is that by the year 2020, uh, the government wants to send 60,000 high school and 120,000 college, uh, uh, no, 60,000 and 120,000, I guess, yeah, uh, college students abroad to study, 180,000 in total. Uh, I will try to show you later on, however, and this is in 2020, which is only about seven years from now. Uh, you will notice later on that at the present time, the number of Japanese going abroad to study is, is going down and down and down, and it's almost, it's, it's less than 60,000, and now it's getting closer to 50,000, so that means three times the number in seven years' time. That's not going to be easy. How the government plans to do that, of course, it's not just a problem of financing. There's a lot of problems about getting jobs for high school students, getting into university. That's where the entrance examination is going to come in. A lot of things have to be changed in order to change this negative trend of the Japanese that we will see later on. Um, uh, this is something else that came out. I'm not really sure why, actually. Um, this uh, is something based on the PISA. Uh, re, uh, results, uh, the OECD uh, academic achievement results. Uh, the Japanese are among the top five in the world, at least uh, the, the nations which are in the OECD, uh, in terms of mathematics and also uh, science. Huh? Uh, in reading comprehension, it seems that we're about number eight or number nine at the present time. We were down to number 15. And that's when the government became very concerned about uh, the ability of the Japan, young Japanese to read, uh, and, and, but somehow in the, in the last um, OECD uh, PISA test results show that we were about number eight or number nine, which means that we've gone up. Now, we're the only nation in the world with a population of over 100 million in the top ten, which means that we're doing a good job. All the other places are real small, like Singapore, for example. So, sure, everybody goes up. Finland is also a very small population, right? A fraction of Japan. All of these other nations are very small populations. And we're the only nation, nation in the world with a, with a hundred million population among the top, top five in, in most of these tests in academic. Uh, and yet the, the government wants to, to make our children number one, in the world, it seems. Uh, I wasn't very pre pleased with, the res uh, with uh, this suggestion that came out. Another one that came out uh, was uh, the creation of uh, global super high schools. Uh, in the past, we had something called the super English language high school, the cell high. Uh, now they're talking about a global super high school. This is a little different because it includes things like accepting foreign students uh, into the schools. Uh, sending students abroad to study, um, including, uh, for example, clear kinds of classes where the, the, the students will be able to uh, use English as a means for learning something else. Um, something which goes beyond, and that's why it's called super global. Uh, it's, it's not simple super, super English. It goes beyond simply teaching English. It, try, it 
they, they, what they're thinking of is trying to include something beyond that, to create more globalized citizens, as, as they say. Okay. Now, nothing concrete has come out yet, but I think uh, the applications for schools who want to become uh, a global super high school, I think they will come out in January or so, at least uh, early next year. That's when the announcements will probably come out. Uh, and of course, uh, a, a very major uh, issue uh, is the, the problem of the university entrance examinations. Uh, the most recent ones have been talking about abolishing the, the, the so-called center test, which is a national uh, university entrance examination test. Uh, and there, I don't know if they're simply th talking about abolishing uh, the, the English test. It doesn't seem like it. it. It seems as though they're thinking of abolishing all the tests. Uh, and the, the proposal is that they want to come up with some kind of a test which can be administered uh, several times uh, during the course of a student's uh, high school. Uh, and uh, the students can take the, the results of one of those tests which clears a certain uh, criterion de determined by the university and if they clear that hurdle then they can send the scores to the university and they'll be, able, uh, they'll be accepted. Um, how this is going to come about I have no idea. Uh, especially when you're talking about uh, knowledge subjects like uh, social studies and so forth. Every time you do a test the scores are going to fluctuate. I mean, it, you can't standardize a knowledge test. It's whether you know it or not. It's not a proficiency test like a language test. Proficiency tests can be normalized. It can be standardized. But knowledge tests can't. It's, it's very difficult to do that. Unless you really have a whole millions of items which have been tested and you're able to select from them, which probably is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, another uh, major problem with the, um, uh, the center test is that it's a national test and therefore uh, what happens is that uh, if somebody says, I want to see that test, uh, the, the, the ministry has an obligation to reveal the content of the test, which means that you can't keep it secret. And that's why at the present time, uh, right after the tests are administered, the test questions all come out and the answers are on the, the newspapers in the very next day. And so every time a test is created, if it's revealed, everything is made open, it's impossible to come up with a valid, reliable test. Even the English tests, the contents of the, uh, the tests are quite good, they're not bad. Uh, but every year, the average score you know, just jumps up and down, ups and down, up and down, all the time. You can't keep it level. It's, it's, it's just not possible to do that at the present time. So there are a lot of problems. That's why the ministry is saying, um, <clears throat> let's try something else. Let's try to use a language proficiency test, like the TOEFL. All right? And when they first came up with the TOEFL, a, a lot of people said, hey, what do you mean by the TOEFL? You know? One of the major problems that came out, I mean, the idea is okay. The idea is fine. Trying to use the results of a language proficiency test as uh, entrance and exit criteria to university, which I, I'm, a, I'm all for it. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. It's a lot better than the entrance examinations that we're making. Right? There's no doubt about that. The only problem is that TOEFL is not made for Japanese, for one thing. I mean, the level is too high. Um, it's, uh, it probably discriminates the best between students who have something around a Jun EQ in the step test and an EQ in the step test. But then if we consider the percentage of Japanese who are at that level, Jun EQ and EQ, it's only about 2% of the population. I mean, using a test for that sort of population doesn't really make much sense as far as the, 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 the majority, the, the great majority of the population is concerned. Uh, as far as the junior and senior high school students are concerned, they're down at the junior level, right? And even that, there's only about 50% of the uh, senior high school students who can get to that level. So it's much too high. Right? And, and, what, and what's going to happen if the, the TOEFL test is used as uh, entrance uh, test criteria? Well, the, the present Gakushu Shido Yorio is going to be ignored by everybody. 
because it's not made to uh, get students to pass TOEFL tests. The cram schools are going to make a lot of money. <laughs> that's the only place that the, uh, the students will be able to prepare for the test. <clears throat> and so the whole educational system is going to flop. I mean, it's just going to go down the drain. And so recently, people are no longer talking about using the TOEFL. And I'll mention later on, a lot of people are now beginning to talk about RT test as an alternative. And I'll talk about that later on. All right, so these are some of the, 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 uh, the, the issues which have been uh, addressed in the past half year or so here in Japan. Now, um, uh, now what I want to do is to look at uh, what the, uh, uh, the results of the Japanese um, proficiency tests are like and the results of questionnaires and other surveys which have been conducted on the Japanese are like. Um, as you can see, uh, the red point that I mentioned here, uh, the, it all comes down to this, uh, this, this, this one point, which is a lack of confidence to use English. And I'll try to show you that. Um, people uh, have always looked at, um, you know, or have compared the Japanese uh, with uh, people from other parts, not only of Asia, but of, uh, of the world as well, by using the result of the results of the, uh, the TOEFL test. Uh, this is the, the newest one from last year, and you can see that it's, a four, it's, it's IBT TOEFL, so the full score is 120, uh, and there are four skills, 30 points each for each one. Uh, and the, uh, the Japanese total uh, uh, average is 70, uh, 70 out of 120, uh, which isn't really that bad, but it, these are the 30 different um, countries in Asia, and the, the average score of uh, the, the, each of these countries, if you take a look at them, uh, shows that 70 is third from the bottom. There are only two other countries lower than Japan, which and they are Cambodia and uh, and Mongolia, All right? And uh, Tajikistan, I guess, has the same score of 70, but that's that means we're third from the bottom. More critical than the total score is this speaking score. 17 out of 30. If you take a look, all the way down. You don't see any 17. We're the only country with a 17. Okay. Right, 17 out of 30. Okay. So we have the lowest score in, in speaking, and this is not just a temporary trend. It's been this way for a long, long time. For a long, long time. As far back as I can remember, when people were still doing the PBT, the paper-based testing. Um, we had very low scores. When the, the speaking test finally came out with the TSE, we had very low scores. And now, we still have low scores. Yeah? Can I just ask you about um, the argument that more students in Japan take the TOEFL? That used to be the case. Is that That's not a problem anymore. Uh, right, it used to be the case that, the, for example, if, uh, when we still had the PBT, right. uh, there were about Let's see, 150,000 Japanese taking the PBT every year, and which, which was the largest number in the world. Large number in the world. Now we have the IBT, which is four skills test. It's a lot more difficult. The number of Japanese taking the IBT is now down to 35,000. And the largest population uh, of uh, 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 examinees is the Koreans, with over 100,000. So we're no longer the largest population. Uh, and this is a, too expensive of a test for somebody just to say, hey, I want to check my English ability. <laughs> uh, they have to be, they have to be, be serious about, about taking this test. I mean, who would want to spend over 20,000 yen per test just to check how good they are in English? You know? uh, that's so, so the numbers are really going down. Uh, there, there is talk. Even uh, I don't know how true this is, uh, that uh, there are Korean examinees who cannot find um, uh, places uh, to uh, to take this test in Korea, so they are coming to Japan to take the TOEFL test in Japan. 
Yeah. But even so, I mean, how many people are taking it in Cambodia? Cambodia? Very small. Right. I mean, I would have to think that in many of those countries, it's really only a very small handful who are still taking it. And 35,000 is still a lot. It's still a lot. 35,000 is still a lot, but uh, there are more Chinese taking the, uh, the TOEFL than the Japanese, more Koreans taking the TOEFL than the Japanese, and uh, some other places like Taiwan, for example, is about uh, very almost the same number as the Japanese taking the TOEFL test. So it's not just the Japanese all the way up there, which used to be the case. It used to be the case that Jap the Japanese were up there. And we were the only ones with 150,000 taking the test. That no longer is the case, okay? Uh, but, but of course, the TOEFL is a special kind of test. Huh? I mean, it's, it's for academic purposes, and not everybody wants to go abroad and study. Uh, and that's why the TOEIC was created here in Japan. I mean, it started here in Japan 32 years ago. Um, uh, Kitaoka, uh, Mr. Kitaoka and the uh, ministry at that time felt that for the Japanese it was more important um, to acquire the kind of English necessary for international business purposes, and that's why the TOEIC test was developed. Uh, and, uh, but even the TOEIC test, if you take the results, you see the Japanese way down there. You know, we're, we're not up there in the TOEIC test as well. Um, the number of Japanese studying abroad, as I said, from the year 2004, the numbers have steadily gone down. Uh, as of uh, 2010, this is the, uh, the, the newest result that I have, uh, but I've heard that it's gone down even further than this. It's down to 58,000. And remember, the Japanese government wants to raise this number to 180,000. But it's still, the tendency is to still uh, going down, decreasing. Okay. Um, it's not just the college students. A lot of people would say, well, for, for the college students, it, it's a problem because uh, the recruiting situation, job hunting situations are getting, it, it's not at that easy. If you go abroad and come back, you might miss a chance to get a good job. And so a lot of people do say, uh, mention that as a reason why maybe the, the college students are not going abroad. But the, the high school students, uh, this is comparison of uh, four different uh, uh, countries, high school students, uh, in Japan, US, China, and Korea. Uh, and the question is, would you like to go abroad and study? Right? Would you like to go abroad and study? Um, the only country with a, the majority of the students saying, no, I do not want to go abroad and study is the Japanese high school students. Now, one of the major reasons is entrance examinations to college. That's a major stumbling block. Right, if they, if they go back, and they go abroad and study, they come back, you know, I mean, that doesn't help them at the present time if they want to take a, uh, a, an entrance examination in English where there is still a lot of emphasis on, on very uh, detailed uh, distinctions in, in grammatical items and so forth, or maybe, um, you know, translation in some universities are still there, uh, then it doesn't really help sometimes. You know? And so uh, it seems that the, the, the problem, although maybe not the only reason, uh, interest examinations uh, is a very major problem. But this is a tendency which is seen also in junior high school. This is junior high school students from the uh, data from 2010. This is comparing uh, their uh, responses uh, from 2003 with 2003 and 2010, a seven year difference. Uh, let's take a look at one here. Do you think English is important for interest examinations? Um, this has gone up. Uh, the blue and the green are the positive responses. All right, so uh, in 2010, 94, uh, 94% of the junior high school students say you have to know English in order to pass entrance examinations. Also uh, here, you think English is important in getting the job that you want to get, all right, in getting a good job? Yes. This was only about 47%. But in 2010, the number, uh, the percentage increases 70%. All right, so now, you know, at least in 2010, 70% of the junior high school students said that uh, English was important in getting a good job. The only problem is down here. In the future, do you want to get a job in which you can use English? This is the only place where the number of students say no has increased. Okay, so it's increased from 
what is it, 44%, uh, no, 54% to now it's over 70%, 71%, 71% of the junior high school students do not want to take on a job where English is going to be important. But, you know, but they, they, they know it's important for their future lives. But they don't want to work where English is necessary. All right, why? Because they probably do not have confidence in using English. Right? They know it's important up here, cognitively, yes, but they, they're not confident. Okay? Um, now this is a report ca which came out from, the, from Sangyo Noritsu uh, Daigaku. Uh, this is the newest one which came out this uh, past July. Okay? Uh, these are uh, over 700 uh, newly hired um, uh, college graduates, newly hired by different companies. Mm -hmm. Over 700 uh, people were, uh, were surveyed. Um, of them, um, those who answered, I, am, I will be willing to work in any country or region, increased from 27% in 2010 to 29.5% in 2013, which is not bad. It's not a bad sign. However, if you take a look at the next one, do you want to work abroad? The percentage of those who said they do not want to go work abroad jumps from 49% in 2010 to 58.3% in 2013. Uh, it seems a little contrary to, uh, you know, uh, to the results right above that. Uh, the next one. And, and the main reason why they don't want to go abroad and study is they do not have confidence in foreign languages, 65.2 percent. That's the major reason. Uh, now, this, the next one is a little troubling. English education in school, has it been help helpful? Over 50 percent say no. Over 50 percent of these college graduates say that uh, English education that they receive has not been helpful. And yet they said that the, uh, the government should strengthen education uh, to create global human resources. About 80% say, that's necessary, but don't look at me. <laughs> I'm, I don't want to do this. But that, they say that it's necessary for the young kids, not them. Okay. Um, the real actual numbers you see there, okay, uh, this is would you like to study abroad. If you take a look in 2001, uh, the percentage of those who said, no, I do not, was only 29.2%. But it's really gone up, and this year it jumped to 58.3%. That's a lot. Twice. Doubled. You know, it's, it's amazing. I thought this, I, I was using the, uh, the data from 2010 for a long time, and I thought this would be the end, uh, that from then on it's going to go down, but then it's gone up again. It's, it's, it's quite troubling. Uh, and the reason uh, I don't is I have no confidence in foreign languages. That's the largest, 65.2 percent. All right, that's the major reason. Um, other things, what are the major concerns, uh, sources of concern for working abroad? Safety, uh, language, and food. In, 19, uh, in 2010, uh, safety was number one. It was, it, was a little more, it was a little more different. It was a little higher than, than language, but now language is caught up. It's really caught up, almost the same, which means that the, the, uh, the, the lack of confidence in language is really becoming a major issue among the young Japanese at the present time. The PDF version of this on the website, so I apologize if you have to squint a bit to see the <laughs> figures. Um, just so you can enjoy it. I'll, I'll leave this whole um, thing on, on on the computer. Oh, thank you. All right, so you can you can use it for anybody who want, might want it. Just write to Jim or to Lena, and they'll be able to send it. And this is uh, has uh, the English education you received in school been useful? Uh, yes, only forty four point one percent. 55.9% said no, it has not been useful. Right. And this is, uh, this is troubling. Huh? Do you want to study, for, now, now, now note, these people do not have confidence in using English, all right? And so you would assume that they would want to study it, 
That doesn't seem to be the case. I do not want to study foreign languages as gone up. Among these young Japanese, in, 19, in 2013, the percentage of those young people just out of college working in these companies who say that they do not want to study foreign languages has gone up from 18.5% in 2010 to 26.6% in 2013. So what is this? You know? There are a s small group of, s of people who say that if they were s to work abroad, they would go anywhere in the world. This has gone up slightly. So there's a, a level of students who are quite good and who are quite confident, probably in their use of English as well. Uh, and there's, there's a, my, a, a, at least a small percentage of these people. But then at the bottom, you've got a l huge number of people who just don't want to go abroad. They have no confidence in English. They want to stay here in Japan. And that's it. And yet they're saying, kids, you've got to study English. Global citizenship is necessary in the future. But these kids are only 20 years old, 20-some years old. So, I don't know, I mean, there's this big gap now between those who can really use English and those who can't. That seems to be a big, big gap, which is widening. This is something that I, I tend to see it by looking at these results. Okay. Now, this is uh, a, um, a questionnaire that I, uh, uh, a survey that I conducted with Vanessa Corporation uh, several years ago. Um, and this was at a time when uh, people were discussing whether to make English an official subject in uh, mandatory subject in the elementary school. Uh, and we asked the parents of uh, children who were at that time attending elementary school uh, how they felt about, uh, about English. And there were, as you can see, 4,718 respondents. Um, do, you, uh, do you like English? 55% say no, they do not like English. Do you have confidence uh, in using English? 90% say no, I do not have confidence in using English. And again, very similar to the newly graduate, new graduates from college, newly hired um, people. Has the English you learned in school been useful to you? 80% say no. 80% say no. And these are all adults, parents of children who are now in elementary school. Uh, and uh, as you can see, have you had problems in using English? 56% say yes, they've had problems in using English. Now this is troubling, of course, very similar to what we saw earlier on. Um, I remember at one time I was uh, talking I was giving a talk to uh, uh, ALT, ALTs in Saitama. Uh, every once in a while, I, I get to, uh, to go to these ALT uh, teacher training sessions, and I, I, I do workshops and so forth. Uh, and after my, my talk, one of the, the young ALTs came to me. This was about 10 years ago. Uh, they still had the oral communication, one, two, and so forth. ABC, I guess, maybe, was still there. Uh, and uh, this, this one American came to me right after my talk and he, he said, uh, at the present time, right now I'm teaching uh, oral communication A, I think it was, A, is com A, I think was English conversation. So he was teaching English conversation in second year senior high school. Uh, and uh, one day one of his students came to him and, uh, and the student said to him directly, uh, please stop teaching English conversation. And the teacher said, well, well, what do you mean? And the student said, because it's not tested in the entrance exams. Therefore, I, we don't want to waste time studying English conversation. And so, as far as the student was concerned, he wanted a, a veteran Japanese teacher who knew how to prepare their students to get into college to teach that course using that hour. All right. And it, this did happen. This did happen to a lot of schools during that time. Um, so they had something called uh, oral communication G, which was oral communication grammar. 
which was not really oral communication, but simply teaching grammar <laughs> using the oral communication slot. Right? This, this happened as a very common thing. And that's what the, te what, that's what the student really wanted as well. Okay? Now, it's, it's very interesting because these, these, uh, these students uh, you know, go through this process of preparing for college entrance examinations, mostly through grammar and translation exercises and so forth. They get into college. And once they get into college, they go back to their schools and they thank their teachers and saying, thank you very much, I got into the college I wanted to. And what they're saying is 10 years later, they're saying, You're, the way you taught English didn't make any sense because it's not, it's not been very helpful since, since I graduated. I mean, it's a dilemma, right? It's a dilemma. And that's why the, the college entrance examinations have to be, you know, it has to be changed. It's got to be changed because that's at the, at, at the core of all of these problems, okay? All right, so now there's another problem. What kind of English is it then that we should be teaching? If we know that the Japanese students are not really becoming confident in, the, in, the, in their use of English, what should we be teaching? How should we be teaching English? What kind of English should we be teaching? Um, I remember this was again over, over 10 years ago. Uh, in, uh, in the English department, uh, we uh, divide the students up into uh, different classes based on the placement test. Uh, and if you get into the highest level, uh, two thirds of the students are returnees. Right? More than, maybe more than two thirds of the students are returnees. Uh, and there was this one Japanese uh, student uh, girl who had studied solely in Japan, did a wonderful job. She passed the EQ in the Aiken, the first grade in the Aiken, in the, in the Aiken. Uh, and she had a very high score on the placement test. So, although she had never been abroad, she was placed in the highest class. All right, so, she was doing wonderful, a wonderful job. Now, two months into the new grade or new year, academic year, she came to me and the first thing she said was, Sensei, I don't want to study English anymore. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, no matter how much I try, I'll never become better than the returnees. You know? So she said, I don't want to study anymore. But she was trying very hard all throughout her high school days you know, to, to, to improve her pronunciation, to try to use English as much as possible. She had reached this level of EQ, which is very, very high. Over 600 on the, on that, on the PBT at the time. Very high level. And yet, you know, she said, I don't want to study English anymore because I, I will never be able to, to, to become better than an attorney. I mean, returnees are wonderful because, you know, I mean, they have lived abroad and they know how to speak. They, uh, they have uh, a control of all these idiomatic expressions. They're very good in communicating in English. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're very good at reading and writing English, but that doesn't really come out. It doesn't stick out. What sticks out is the oral proficiency. That's what really sticks out, right? People, when they're studying a foreign language, they want to sound good. They want to improve their pronunciation. They want to be able to speak better. That seems to be the major goal for many people who are trying to study or study foreign language. And so that's what the student said. I don't know what happened later on because she graduated, so I guess it was okay. But this was only about you know uh, two months into the new academic year. She, she was here at Sofia for the first time, and I think she was shocked to see the number of returnees in that one class and that she felt as though she was the lowest, the poorest student the whole, whole class. Huh? And so she, she really began to lose confidence in her, in her English. Now, the, the problem here is what kind of English are we trying to teach our students? That's, that's, a, that's an issue. Okay? Uh, this is something that comes from um, a, a document in, uh, in the EU plurilingual and pluricultural competence uh, in which uh, the authors talk about the difference between multilingualism and plurilingualism. Right? Uh, multilingualism or bilingualism uh, is something that uh, exists most, mostly in English-speaking countries and English-speaking contexts 
like the United States, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth, where English is a second language for the immigrant population, for the foreign population living in that country. In other words, multiple languages exist side by side in this society and are utilized separately. So when people are talking to Americans, they use English. They're talking to their members of their family, they use their native language. They're used separately. Uh, and often, it, it, it conjures the concepts of balanced bilingual and perfect user. So you're in a country where everything is done in English, and therefore uh, you have to be able to use English uh, from everyday uh, transactions, at stores, and in school, and business, and whatever. Everything in your life, you have to sound, or at least you have to acquire knowledge of English, right? And when we look at the, the old uh, motivational studies that Gardner and Lambert used to do, integrative motivation, the kind of motivation that says, I want to become a member of such and such society. This kind of integrative motivation was considered to be the strongest motivation in, in the acquisition of English or a language. That it would, and and it, the results did show that this was the case, especially in countries like the United States. When you had immigrants, populations, and this uh, motivational research was done, those people who said, I want to be like an American, were the ones who had the highest scores. And it was true. So integrative motivation was true in that kind of context. Okay? So as far as the immigrants were concerned, they had to learn English. They had to become like Americans to be accepted by the society, to succeed in the society. Therefore, they really tried hard to uh, acquire the native English which was spoken in that culture. However, in Europe and in other EFL countries, that's not necessarily the case because the context is EFL, which means that outside of the educational institution. Uh, basically, the native language of the speaker is used. So here in Japan, Japanese is used for all spheres of life, and English is spoken and used only for a very limited purpose, mostly in the schools, mostly in educational settings. Now, what, this, what the, the authors say is that competence, the plurilingualism, refers to a competence in more than one language which can be switched according to the circumstances at hand for the purpose of coping with the social matter. In other words, if you need English for academic purposes, then you'll speak English. But it doesn't mean that you need it for, for example, uh, everyday uh, shopping. If you go shopping, you, all you need is Japanese. You don't need English to shop here in Japan. But if you're going to study uh, about certain topics in English, then you have to know English. Or in business. Uh, if you are going into a company where there is a lot of transaction between uh, people from around the world, then you need English for business purposes. But it doesn't mean that you need English for uh, everyday purposes. It doesn't mean that you need English to talk to your family. Right? So it's, it's different from the kind of multilingual situation that you see. And here, and another point is that it doesn't, right here, multiple competence is always individualized. Each person is going to have different needs. All right, so it's not going to be the same for everybody. All right? It's going to be evolving because as students we might need uh, English for study purposes, but after we graduate we might need it for business purposes. Okay, so things will change as, as we uh, go on in society. And it's going to be heterogeneous. Everybody's going to be different. Right? It's not going to be the same. And it's going to be unbalanced. doesn't mean that English and Japanese are going to be at the same level. Japanese is always going to be higher. English is going to be there for the purpose for which we need that language. Okay? That sort of pluri, plurilingual idea uh, is the kind of concept which is being adopted in, in, in Europe. Uh, and the point here is which kind of context are we in? That's, that's a major concern. As far as that student that I was talking about is concerned, she was trying to be like an American, definitely. I mean, that was her goal. She wanted to be like an American. She wanted to sound like an American. She wanted to be able to speak like an American. And she tried so hard, so hard. But if you go back and you know, read things written by Whittleson or by Krashen, you know that there really is only a fraction of all those people who are studying English who can reach native like level. The great, great majority of the people who are studying English either as a second language or, or a foreign language will never reach that level. 
their languages will stop at some point, um, interlanguage level. There will be some kind of a fossilization, at least in one, for example, pronunciation is an area where fossilization really creeps in very, very, very quick, quickly. Huh? So it, we're, we're going to stop somewhere. Right? So it, it, it's not a very practical goal to, to want to become like a native speaker in most contexts where English is being learned as, an, a, as a foreign language. 